So as you know, I will show you with the help of a diagram, if you can appreciate over here. So this is the skeletal muscle. This is the cross section of a skeletal muscle. So what you can appreciate over here that these are the individual muscle fibers. And these individual muscle fibers, if you see, they are basically forming a group of muscle fiber, which is called as a nerve fascicle. Now, if you look at the individual muscle fiber, this is an individual muscle fiber. This is an individual muscle fiber. So individual muscle fiber, if you see, they are basically surrounded by endomycium. So endomycium is present around individual muscle fibers as we can appreciate over here. Okay, whereas a group of individual muscle fibers, they are forming what is known as a muscle fascicle. Okay, they are called as a fascicle. Okay, they form what is called as a fascicle. And in each fascicle is basically, if you see, is surrounded by what is called as a perimyceum. So each fascicle, each collection of a muscle fiber, each collection of individual muscle fiber is uh, basically surrounded by what is known as a perimyceum, which is surrounding a bundle of muscle fibers or muscle fascicle, okay, fascicle. And if you see all these fascicles all together, they are surrounded by yet another piece of, you know, tissue that is called as the epimyceum, which is surrounding the entire muscle. Okay, which is, uh, you know, surrounding the entire muscle. So, individual muscle fibers surrounded by endomycium, a group of individual muscle fibers, they form the fascicle, which is surrounded by the perimyceum and all the muscle together is surrounded by the epimyceum. Okay, histologically under the microscope, if you see, this is the outer layer, okay, which is surrounding the entire muscle, which is forming the epimyceum. Then you are looking at the individual muscle fibers over here. This is the individual muscle fiber. Let me take a lighter pen. This is the individual muscle fiber that you can appreciate over here. Individual muscle fiber. They are surrounded by the endomycium and a group of individual muscle fiber which is forming a fascicle. Okay, fascicle. Okay, fascicle. They are basically surrounded by the perimycium. They are surrounded by the perimycium. Okay, now what is very important if you look at these individual muscle fibers, if you see what is the shape they are basically poly polygonal in shape they are polygonal in shape not only that they are having multiple nucleus so they are multinucleated they are multinucleated and these nucleus they are peripherally located they are located at the periphery they are located at the periphery that in case of proximal uh, you know limb weakness the favorable site in the lower limb, they are the rectus femoris as you can appreciate over here and the vastus lateralis as we can appreciate over here. So these are the two important site of taking muscle biopsy in proximal limb weakness in the lower limb. In the upper limb, the basic site is the biceps. The biceps is the basic site or the most important site in case of the upper limb, proximal limb weakness. In case of distal muscle weakness, the most important site is the, as we have seen, the gastrocnemius muscle as you can appreciate which is present in the back and the tibialis anterior muscle as you can see over here in the front. So these are the two important sites of taking biopsy in distal limb weakness. And deltoid is also an alternate site and it is a better site as compared to the biceps for taking biopsy, okay. This is the deltoid is another site for taking biopsy, okay, for the muscle, okay. So what you can appreciate over here are the two types of muscle fibers, that is type 1 and type 2 muscle fibers and they are subjected to different kind of reactions. So, in the first type, in the standard or in the alkaline ATPase reaction, which is conducted at the pH of 9.4, the type 1 fiber, these are the type 1 fibers as we can appreciate, they are appearing light, whereas the type 2 fibers, okay, they are appearing dark. So, over here, they have subdivided into 2A, 2B, 2C, but whatever, they are dark, okay. So, this is basically the standard or in normal muscles, okay, they are giving an appearance of a checkerboard they give an appearance of a checkerboard, okay, checkerboard appear. This is the, in case of a normal muscle fiber. This is a checkerboard appearance is, can be seen. So, in a normal muscle fiber, uh, you know, when you carry out ATPase reaction at an alkaline pH of 9.4, type 1 fibers, they are light as we can appreciate, type 2 fibers are darker. Now, we come to the same ATPase reaction, but now we change the pH to acidic. Myself, Dr. Gibran Ahmad presents to you Simply Pathology and today we are back with a very important session. Today, as you can see, we are going to start off with a very important exam topic that is muscle biopsy interpretation. Now, very, very importantly, in today's topic of discussion, we are going to see the part one of muscle biopsy interpretation 
and this will be followed by a series of lectures as in the part 2 and part 3 okay part 2 and part 3 will follow after this part number 1 now this topic of discussion is very important for all the pathology residents across the country as well as across this world now very importantly this topic is very important because it is not properly discussed in any of the standard textbooks that we follow so please pay a lot of attention because a lot of details we have discussed and a lot of information we have combined together for you people so that you can read uh, you know in a very short period of time and you can you know get a lot of information out of this video so without wasting any time let us begin today's topic of discussion now in the part one we are going to read about the basic introduction to the muscle biopsy what are the indications of muscle biopsy then the normal histology and the structure of the muscles then most importantly we will discuss about the biopsy requisites okay what is the site of biopsies what are the different types of biopsy which we are conducting then we are going to discuss about the triaging or the division of the biopsy how you have to divide the biopsy specimen for the various studies that you have to conduct or that you will conduct on the muscle biopsy specimen as well as the tissue processing along with that we are going to see the various stains which are used for the interpretation of the muscle biopsy and not only that we are also going to see okay how a normal muscle biopsy looks like under the microscope and what are the normal histochemical stains that we are using the routine histochemical stains that we are using and how to interpret them not only that we are also going to discuss about the artifacts which we encounter while processing the muscle biopsy so let us begin today's topic of discussion without wasting any more time so basically if you see a muscle biopsy is a procedure in which a piece of muscle tissue is removed and examined microscopically it was first introduced in 1868 by Duchenne. now it plays a very important role in evaluation of patients with neuromuscular disease and it is required to provide definitive diagnosis in many neuromuscular disorders muscle biopsy can sometimes help us to distinguish between a neurogenic where the pathology is at the nerves innervating those muscles or myogenic where the pathology is lying within the muscle tissue itself okay so muscle biopsy can help us to distinguish between a neurogenic or a myogenic disorder secondly muscle biopsy gives us information on the course of the disease whether the disease is acute or chronic as well as on the disease stage and progression and muscle biopsy also helps us to distinguish among various types of myopathies by microscopic analysis for different characteristics when exposed to variety of chemical reactions and stains okay so this is some of the uses of the muscle biopsy at present muscle biopsy is necessary for diagnosis of several categories of muscle disease including hereditary disorders like muscular dystrophies or myotonic dystrophies and acquired myopathies such as inflammatory myopathies and toxic and drug induced myopathies muscle biopsy should be considered and interpreted together with the patient's family history clinical history drug history as well as in the light of other tests like serum uh, you know creatine kinase as well as electromyography and other tests okay so muscle biopsy should always be considered and interpreted together in the light of clinical data family history as well as drug history and any other clinical test like the test of you know like, like laboratory tests like the serum uh, creatinine kinase levels or electromyography so you have to take all these information together into account before interpreting a muscle biopsy slide now what are the indications of carrying out muscle biopsy so the indications can either be a generalized indication or a specific indication so generalized means whenever a patient is presenting with a muscle weakness of uncertain cause or you know severe muscle pain cramps or stiffness which is consistently present or persistently elevated muscle enzyme so these are some of the generalized indications for carrying out a muscle biopsy secondly coming to some of these specific indications so over here the specific indications can be uh, when you are suspecting a particular you know disorder or a particular disease or a particular you know established muscle disease or a muscle disorder okay so it can be either you are suspecting a hereditary muscle disorder for example there is a known family member which is already affected so in that case so hereditary muscle disorders for which muscle biopsy is indicated these include muscular dystrophies like Duchenne's and Becker's muscular dystrophy or certain myotonic dystrophies congenital myopathies or channelopathies or any primary metabolic disorders or disorders of carbohydrate or lipid metabolism affecting the muscles 
or when you have to detect an asymptomatic carrier in a case of suspected hereditary disorder. So, this is the specific indication in case of a hereditary muscle disorder. Secondly, uh, the, uh, you know, the second important specific myopathy are the acquired myopathies. When you are suspecting inflammatory myopathies like polymyositis, dermatomyositis, inclusion body myositis or necrotizing autoimmune myopathy or any toxic or drug induced myopathies or you, when you are suspecting endocrine myopathies or any systemic endless associated myopathies. For example, those myopathies which are associated with systemic connective tissue disease and vasculitis like polyarthritis nodosa or infection related to the muscles like trichinosis. Okay. So, these are some of the specific indications. Okay. And uh, in continuation with those, okay, muscle biopsy also indicated when you are suspecting a storage disease or for confirmation of a clinical diagnosis or you whenever you are having a conflicting clinical laboratory as well as electromyographic findings or when you have to assess the disease progression as well as the prognosis of a particular disease okay so these are the indications for carrying out a muscle biopsy the generalized and specific indications okay now now we are going to you know start off with the normal histology and the structure of muscles because without knowing the normal histology and structure of muscles you will not be able to understand the abnormalities which are there in the muscles and especially over here we are playing more stress on the skeletal muscles okay on the skeletal muscles so as you know i will show you with the help of a diagram if you can appreciate over here so this is the skeletal muscle this is the cross section of a skeletal muscle so, what you can appreciate over here that these are the individual muscle fibers and these individual muscle fibers if you see they are basically forming a group of muscle fiber which is called as a nerve fascicle. Now, if you look at the individual muscle fiber, this is an individual muscle fiber, this is an individual muscle fiber. So, individual muscle fiber if you see they are basically surrounded by endomycium. So, endomycium is present around individual muscle fibers as we can appreciate over here okay whereas a group of individual muscle fibers they are forming what is known as a muscle fascicle okay they are called as a fascicle okay they form what is called as a fascicle and in each fascicle is basically if you see is surrounded by what is called as a perimysium so each fascicle each collection of a muscle fiber each collection of individual muscle fiber is uh, basically surrounded by what is known as a perimysium which is surrounding a bundle of muscle fibers or muscle fascicle okay fascicle and if you see all these fascicles all together they are surrounded by yet another piece of you know tissue that is called as the epimysium which is surrounding the entire muscle okay which is uh, you know surrounding the entire muscle so individual muscle fiber surrounded by endomysium a group of individual muscle fibers they form the fascicle which is surrounded by the perimysium and all the muscle together is surrounded by the epimysium okay histologically under the microscope if you see this is the outer layer okay which is surrounding the entire muscle which is forming the epimysium then you are looking at the individual muscle fibers over here this is the individual muscle fiber let me take a lighter pen this is the individual muscle fiber that you can appreciate over here individual muscle fiber they are surrounded by the endomysium and a group of individual muscle fiber which is forming a fascicle okay fascicle okay fascicle they are basically surrounded by the perimysium they are surrounded by the perimysium okay now what is very important if you look at these individual muscle fibers if you see what is the shape they are basically poly polygonal in shape they are polygonal in shape not only that they are having multiple nucleus so they are multinucleated they are multinucleated and these nucleus they are peripherally located they are located at the periphery they are located at the periphery so this is the basic anatomy and basic histology of the skeletal muscle okay you can see they are multinucleated individual muscle fibers they are having multiple nucleus as well as they are peripherally located okay they are periphery located so whatever i have spoken with you i'm just going to read it out okay so the individual muscle fibers or the muscle cells are grouped together into elongated bundles called the fasciculi or fascicles with delicate supporting tissue called endomysium which are occupying the space between individual muscle fiber each fascicle or each bundle of muscle fibers okay they are surrounded by loose collagenous tissue called perimysium 
most of the muscles are made up of many fasciculi and the whole muscle mass is invested in a dense collagenous sheath that is called as epimyceum. So, I hope you understand what is the endomyceum, what is perimyceum, what is epimyceum. Now, outside the epimyceum, what you will see that, not outside, but actually you will see that large blood vessels and nerves, they are entering the epimyceum and they divide to ramify throughout the muscle in the perimyceum and the endomyceum. Now, remember, as I told you that the individual muscle fibers, they are typically polygonal. Okay, individual adult muscle fibers are typically polygonal. They are peripherally located nucleus and each myocyte is multinucleated as I have already shown you. So, this is the basic anatomy of the skeletal muscles as you can appreciate over here and the basic histology of the skeletal muscle. Now, this is basically the longitudinal section. This is the longitudinal section as you can appreciate. So, in the longitudinal section, what you can appreciate over here, you can see the cross triations of the skeletal muscle. And this is what, this is the cross section. This is the cross section. Cross section is you have taken a muscle, when you cut it like this, this is the transverse or the cross section. If this is the muscle, when you cut it from top, then it you will get a longitudinal section. Okay. Now, as you can appreciate, as we have already discussed, what are these? These are the individual, these are the individual muscle fibers surrounded by the endomyceum. Okay. Now, this for example, over here, a group of individual muscle fibers, they are surrounded by what? By the perimyceum. Okay, and then on the outer aspect, not visible over here, they are surrounded by the, they are surrounded by what? By the epimyceum. Okay, and you can appreciate they are of different size and shape. They are polygonal in shape, individual muscle fibers, and they are multinucleated. So you can see individual ones are having multiple nucleus. Okay, and they are peripherally located. Now, one more important thing I would like to mention over here, one kind of artifact that we can appreciate over here, you can see, you can see some, a lot of spaces. You can see a lot of space between the, muscle fibers okay so this is called as a shrinkage artifact this is called as a shrinkage artifact which is more pronounced in paraffin embedded hne uh, uh, sections okay uh, as compared to the frozen section so shrinkage artifact is not seen in the frozen section uh, but it is more uh, common in the paraffin embedded tissues okay okay now, next, I would just like to show you the smooth muscles, but uh, you know, we are mainly dealing with the skeletal muscles over here. So, if you see the smooth muscles, they are spindle shaped, they are plumb spindle shaped, or, and each of these cells, they are, they are having a single nucleus and they are centrally located nucleus as we can appreciate over here. And over here, you can see bundle of nerve fibers together forming the muscle fascicle over here as we can see. Okay. And one important point of difference, if you look at the cut section of these, then the, the, they, are, they are having a single nucleus and these nucleus, if you appreciate, they are located at the center and around the, the central nucleus, you are having a perinuclear light area. Okay, So, this is just for comparison and we have already discussed in details about the basic histology of the muscles when we have discussed the basic tissue histology in the basic tissue sections. Okay, So, over here, what is more important is the basic anatomy and histology of the skeletal muscle, which I am sure you are very clear with. Okay. Now, next, we are going to come to a very, very important heading that is the biopsy requisites, the site of the biopsy, what are the different types of biopsy that we do and how you divide the biopsy section and how you process the biopsy sections. Okay, This is very important. So, what are the important requisites while you are conducting a muscle biopsy? So, remember this point very importantly that the requesting physician, the performing surgeon or the physician the lab tissue processing technologist, the histopathologist, all these individuals, they should work together in sync and they should work closely together to ensure proper procedure and biopsy handling as well as the biopsy interpretation. So, right from the time the physician decides to conduct a muscle biopsy, the reason for which he wants to do that, he should uh, convey the same to the uh, uh, performing surgeon or even if the same physician is performing the biopsy. He should inform the, you know, histopathologist, okay, who will receive because the timeline is very important. You should not, uh, you know, because this procedure is not very common and not, not a lot, lot of people have expertise in carrying out the procedure and also the interpretation and everything is not available, you know, quite widely in all the places. Therefore, you should be very, you should be completely ready and because the procedure is not that much simple, it is quite invasive procedure. So, you should be ready and you should not waste the tissue sample. That is why all the individuals, they should work together closely. Not only that, the performing histopathologist should also have 
द क्लियर कट क्लिनिकल गाइडलाइंस द क्लिनिकल हिस्ट्री फैमिली हिस्ट्री ड्रग हिस्ट्री सो दैट ही कैन इंटरप्रेट दो स्लाइड करेक्टली ओके नाउ अप्रोप्रिएट मसल शुड बी सैंपल ओके इट इज नॉट लाइक वॉट इज द मीनिंग ऑफ अप्रोप्रिएट मसल दैट पर्टिकुलर मसल दैट यू आर टेकिंग द बायोप्सी फ्रॉम शुड बी रिप्रेजेंटेटिव ऑफ द डिजीज प्रोसेस नाउ फॉर एग्जाम्पल इफ अ पर्टिकुलर डिजीज प्रोसेस इज इन्वॉल्विंग द लोअर लिम्स सो यू शुड नॉट टेक बायोप्सी फ्रॉम द अपर लिम ओके अपर लिम मसल इन दैट केस सो दिस इज द इम्पॉर्टेंस ऑफ अप्रोप्रिएट मसल शुड बी सैंपल now the specimen should be obtained from a muscle in which the disease process is active and evolving disease process okay what is the meaning of that 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 particular muscle should not be in the end stage it should be active and evolving now remember one thing that moderately involved muscle having a grade mrc grade 3 or 4 should be selected for taking biopsy mrc stands for medical research council and there is a grading of Uh, you know um, of how much a particular muscle is involved by the disease process so there is a grading from 0 to 5 there is a six stages of grading grade 0 mrc grade 1 2 3 4 and 5 so out of this grade 3 and 4 mrc muscle also called as moderately involved muscle should be selected for carrying out the muscle biopsy avoid severely affected muscles in which marked weakness or atrophy of the muscles is present because in that case interpretation would become very difficult for example just like in end stage renal disease if you get the biopsy everything has atrophied whatever pathology was there you cannot appreciate that similarly if you take a biopsy from a severely affected muscle you will not be able to interpret the slide properly that is why moderately involved muscle that is mrc grade 3 or 4 should be selected okay the biopsy should be obtained from the belly of the muscle and deep to the fascia to avoid including myotendinous junctions that can be confused with a myopathic change now it is very important that whenever you take the biopsy you take the biopsy from the belly of the muscle so for example this is the insertion of the muscle and over here this is the main mass of the muscle this is the main belly so try to take the biopsy from the belly and not from the point of tendinous insertion because if you take biopsy from here over here you might mistake the particular slide for a myopathy because over here the fibers are not of the same side they are of variable sizing and over here because of the tendons which are present over there you might mistake it for fibrosis okay so that is why the site of biopsy should be the belly of the muscle and it should be deep to the fascia and avoid taking biopsy at the point of tendinous junctions okay because over there you might confuse it for a myopathic change also the site of needle stick like for example whenever you are carrying out electromyography or any immunization is done okay at a particular slide site so please do not take biopsy from that side or any site which was previously exposed to any kind of trauma okay so this is very very important so these are the very important requisites before you plan a muscle biopsy you should keep all these things in your mind next we are going to see the site of muscle biopsy so in case of proximal muscle involvement okay the quadriceps okay the the quadriceps that is the rectus femoris or the vastus lateralis okay and the biceps and the biceps are biopsy okay so a proximal muscle involvement is there whether it be upper or lower limb so in the lower limb you have to go for the quadriceps that is the rectus femoris or the vastus lateralis whereas in the upper limb you should go for the biceps so the biceps are biopsy while under suspicion of mitochondrial disorder then the deltoid is preferred remember one thing that more than the biceps the deltoid is preferred because uh, uh, you know deltoid uh, because most of the neuromuscular disorders they are going from proximal to distal so that is why the deltoid is involved in the first instance itself so that is why it is important okay now remember the gastrocnemius and the tibialis anterior muscles are appropriate choices in disease with distal limb signs and symptoms okay so in case of distal limb signs and symptoms the gastrocnemius and tibialis anterior muscles are the appropriate choice now remember whatever and wherever the samples you take the samples must be immediately frozen or fixed after excision to prevent loss of enzymatic activity dna depletion or rna degradation or rna degradation okay now over here as we can appreciate the site of muscle biopsy so as we have already discussed previously that in case of proximal uh, you know limb weakness the favorable site in the lower limb they are the rectus femoris as you can appreciate over here and the vastus lateralis as we can appreciate over here so these are the two important site of taking muscle biopsy in proximal limb weakness in the lower limb in the upper limb the basic site is the 
biceps the biceps is the basic site or the most important site in case of the upper limb proximal limb weakness in case of distal muscle weakness the most important site is the as we have seen the gastrocnemius muscle as you can appreciate which is present in the back and the tibialis anterior muscle as you can see over here in the front so these are the two important sites of taking biopsy in distal limb weakness and deltoid is also an alternate site and it is a better site as compared to the biceps for taking biopsy okay this is the deltoid is another site for taking biopsy okay for the muscle okay so these are the important sites of biopsy now the type of biopsy so biopsies can be conducted under two types one is the open biopsy open biopsy means wherein you are taking a long a, 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 you know a 4 to 6 centimeter incision is taken and then with the help of uh, you know a, a proper uh, uh, you know incision is taking and then a biopsy is taking you know it's an open procedure completely whereas the needle biopsy over here the incision is very small it is calculated in millimeters approximately 4 mm in size okay and a much smaller incision is taking in case of needle biopsy technique so there are two techniques one is the open biopsy one is the needle biopsy so just let me show you with the help of a diagram so that you understand so over here you are taking an incision okay with the help of a surgical blade and over here you are separating the fascias and completely are going inside and you are doing the dissection and over here the muscle tissue can be seen you can see this is this this is the length of the incision a very long incision is taking four to six centimeter long incision is taking place that is the open biopsy over here whereas the needle biopsy a very small incision in, in mm approximately four to five mm incision is taking a very small incision is taking in case of a needle is used okay so there are two ways in which the muscle biopsies can be taken one is the open biopsy one is the needle biopsy so as you know what are the advantages of the needle biopsy as we have already seen the needle biopsy procedure because the incision size is small therefore it is less invasive as it has a smaller incision secondly there is a lower rates of complication as compared to the open biopsy that is the incidence of infection or, inf or incidence of bleeding is far less as compared to the open biopsy or the the chances of you know um, uh, injuring nearby nerves or vessels is also less in case of needle biopsy because the size is small therefore there is minimal scarring and multiple site biopsy is possible in case we are using needle biopsies multiple site biopsies are possible the disadvantages of needle biopsy is that that limited amount of sampling can be taken uh, in case of needle biopsy which is the only drawback because the size of the incision is very small and because the needle is taking very less so the amount of sample or the sample specimen that you obtain is very small in case of needle biopsy but this was there previously nowadays there are very good instruments and the procedure has been modified and even the instruments have been modified over a period of time so now an adequate amount of specimen can be obtained okay now before excision from the patient before you are excising the particular muscle the muscle specimen should be maintained in an isometric state this is the isometric expanded state that we have kept the muscle by using a muscle clamp so this is a muscle clamp and we have kept the muscle in a in a stretched manner we have kept the muscle in a stretched isometric you know state we have maintained that why do we do so this is done to avoid contraction artifacts suppose if you cut both the muscles okay so suddenly both the muscles they are going to contract and they will lead to formation of contraction artifact okay which is caused because of cutting the muscle when you cut to you know, two ends of the muscle biopsy all the muscles in between they are going to contract like this and they are going to produce what is called as a contraction artifact i will show you in the end what these contraction artifacts are now at least two separate specimens are routinely requested okay or routinely performed biopsy should be transported to the laboratory as fresh tissue wrapped in saline moisture and gauze once in the laboratory the muscle tissue is distributed or triaged okay to best evaluate the pathology to best evaluate the pathology i will discuss in details how you have to triage or how you have to divide okay so till now i hope you have understood these points so as we have already discussed previously so this is the open method of the muscle biopsy wherein you can see that the incision is very big over here this is the size of incision whereas for needle biopsy the incision size is 4 to 5 mm whereas in open biopsy the incision size is 4 to 6 millimeter uh, 4 to 6 centimeter in case of open biopsy now this is the modified bergstrom's needle which is used to perform the muscle biopsy okay not only that we also have another whale blakesley cocotome as you can appreciate over here which is having a uh, scissors okay or a basically a cocotome is there which is having an angle 
okay and it is basically used again to perform a percutaneous muscle biopsy and over here also the size of incision is very small compared to the open biopsy of the muscles next we are going to understand how to divide the particular biopsy and how to process the biopsy specimen so a standard approach is to distribute the tissue in the following way number one for frozen section or for cryo section histology okay this is one and second uh, you are having stored frozen tissue for possible biochemical or molecular studies so basically whenever you divide the biopsy specimen it is divided under two headings one is one tissue is a fresh specimen that you take for processing which is mainly for frozen section and another is you take a fixed specimen that you take you know for uh, electron microscopy of a routine h and &E, you know uh, 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 staining for that purpose you take a fixed specimen so i will you know make you understand that how you divide so biopsy division is based on either you will use a fresh specimen or you are going to use a fixed specimen so both of them are required usually but the most important you know way in which you process is is at a is as a fresh specimen so fresh specimen is basically used for frozen section or cryo section histology and secondly fresh specimen is used you know for storing the frozen tissue for any future possible biochemical or molecular study so i will just repeat once more that whenever you obtain a muscle biopsy specimen okay it can be used in two ways it is it is used in two ways the first important way is used as a fresh specimen and secondly as a fixed specimen so you are taking two samples two muscle biopsy sample one sample you are subjecting as a fresh specimen to be used for frozen section histology or to be stored for future biochemical or molecular studies and the second specimen that you are taking the muscle biopsy specimen that is fixed either in glutaraldehyde for electron microscopy or it is fixed in uh, you know 10 percent neutral buffered formalin for paraffin embedment for standard histology for routine h and &E staining okay so both of them are required but the more important one is the fresh specimen okay so fresh specimen as we can see they are used for frozen section or cryo section histology or for stored frozen section for possible biochemical or molecular studies now the portion of the biopsy which is chosen for cryo section should optimally be around 0.5 cm in diameter and 1 cm in length and the same size is also applicable for specimens which are to be fixed okay 0.5 cm diameter to 1 cm in length is more than enough okay now when the specimens arrive in the laboratory the fresh specimens are mounted in appropriate orientation on a cork by using a cryostat embedding medium that is called as the OCT medium or the OCT compound with fibers oriented longitudinally in the vertical plane and then that particular specimen is snap frozen by immersing it into isopentane which is pre-chilled in liquid nitrogen to minus 160 degree centigrade so i know you have not understood anything that is why this diagram is there to help you out so suppose now this is the fresh muscle sample that we have taken and this particular sample has been oriented longitudinally over here like this which has been placed longitudinally okay and it is basically placed on the plastic cover slip and the plastic cover slip having this particular muscle you know uh, specimen it is basically introduced into a particular supporting medium that is called as an embedding medium which is called as OCT compound you might remember about the OCT compound which we have discussed in details when we have read about the frozen section okay and the muscles are oriented in a way that the fibers are are longitudinal and then in this particular setup they are basically mounted on a particular cork as we can appreciate over here this is the muscle placed longitudinally embedded in OCT compound and they are mounted in a cork and with this they are dipped in a pre-chilled uh, you know liquid nitrogen uh, in a pre-chilled isopentane pre-chilled in liquid nitrogen to minus 160 degrees centigrade so the muscles biopsy specimen it is snap frozen it is snap frozen okay it is snap frozen and once it is snap frozen then at around 18 to 20 degrees centigrade uh, frozen cryostat sections around 10 micrometer uh, you know are cut from this particular sample for histological evaluation HNE or for GMS Gomori trichrome uh, uh, staining or for fiber typing using ATPase at multiple pH levels or uh, you know using reduced NADH TR okay reductase tetrazoleum reductase NADH tetrazoleum reductase so this is the use of the frozen cryostat section that we have obtained now you must be thinking why we have taken the muscle longitudinally 
because if we are orienting them in this particular fashion then once the particular block for example this block is formed then you can take the sections like this okay then cross sections can come under the microscope okay now whenever needed whenever needed a wide range of histochemical enzyme histochemical immunohistochemistry immunofluorescence techniques can be applied to both the paraffin as well as the frozen sections so in both the paraffin embedded sections or the frozen sections we can you, you know we, we can store the frozen section as i told you you can store the frozen section for future possible molecular or biochemical or ihc or any other studies all frozen tissue should be stored wrapped in foil inside an airtight container like polycon and most laboratories used minus 80 degree centigrade freezer for specimen storage now this this was the you know the method for fresh specimen now for fixed specimen fixed specimen mean those specimen which will first be fixed and then later depending on the use so the first important way is to fix the specimen the second specimen into 10% neutral buffered formalin okay and this is done basically when the tissue is paraffin embedded so this is the routine histological you know procedure or routine hne or for the routine histological processing of the specimens as we are doing for paraffin embedded so paraffin embedded for standard histology they are fixed in 10% neutral buffered formalin for carrying out routine hne staining hematoxylin eosin staining sometimes we are also you know preserving the muscle specimen or we are subjecting them to glutaraldehyde fixation so as to carry out any further possible ele electron microscopy so for electron microscopy we are using epon embedment for possible electron microscopy wherein 3% glutaraldehyde fixation is required okay and that is followed by a staining with toluidine blue okay so this is how the biopsy division is done and how the biopsy is processed for different things now as you understand over here fiber typing in skeletal muscles of human is very important now there are two types of fibers in human beings one is the type 1 fiber which is a red slow or oxidative type of muscle fibers and then there is type 2 fibers which is white fast and glycolytic now we are going to see the difference between individual individual muscle fibers now type 1 fiber is constituting 35 to 40 percent of all the muscle fibers whereas type 2 is constituting 60 to 65 percent of all the muscle fibers if you look at the activity type 1 fiber the activity they are aerobic type 2 is anaerobic fatigue the type 1 fibers they are resistant to fatigue whereas the type 2 fibers are easily fatigued <laughs> if you look at the use type 1 fibers are basically used for endurance or sustained activity whereas type 2 is used in case of sudden burst of activity the myoglobin concentration in type 1 is high whereas it is low in type 2 the atps activity at the ph 9.4 it is low for type 1 therefore they are light when you are staining when you are checking for the atps activity at alkaline ph whereas the the activity is high in type 2 muscle that is why they are dark okay i will show you with the help of diagram oxidative enzyme content is high for type 1 whereas it is low for type 2 the glycogen content is low for type 1 whereas it is high for type 2 phosphorylase activity is low for type 1 whereas it is high for type 2 lipid content is high in type 1 and it is low in type 2 and atps activity at a uh, acidic ph over here we had seen alkaline ph atps activity at ph 4.6 it's completely opposite of that we said alkaline ph so type 1 muscle fibers are darker whereas the type 2 fibers they are lighter compared to the type 1 and type 2 is further divided in type 2a and 2b so 2a is light and 2b is intermediate between uh, type 1 and type 2a okay so this is the fiber typing in skeletal muscles of the humans now, now remember one thing that human muscle is constructed of both fiber types which are arranged in a mixed mosaic pattern resembling checkerboard pattern what is this pattern i will show you with the help of diagram remember one thing that fiber typing is not possible in routine uh, you know uh, uh, routine slides which are stained with hematoxylin and eosin that is why we have to carry special staining okay so before i read all of them i will show you with the help of a diagram so what you can appreciate over here are the two types of muscle fiber that is type 1 and type 2 muscle fibers and they are subjected to different kind of reactions so in the first type in the standard or in the alkaline atps reaction which is conducted at the ph of 9.4 the type 1 fiber these are the type 1 fibers as we can appreciate they are appearing light whereas the type 2 fibers okay they are appearing dark so over here they have subdivided into 2a 2b 2c but whatever they are dark okay 
so this is basically the standard or in normal muscles okay they are giving an appearance of a checkerboard they give an appearance of a checkerboard okay checkerboard appear this is the, in case of a normal muscle fiber this is the checkerboard appearance is can be seen so in a normal muscle fiber uh, you know when you carry out atps reaction at an alkaline ph of 9.4 type 1 fibers they are light as we can appreciate type 2 fibers are darker now we come to the same atps reaction but now we change the ph to acidic ph